And now to the official material. It's time to get into some code. And we're going to talk about Ruby in a pretty quick overview. Of course, as you already know, the best way to learn any kind of a language is to write some programs in it. So uh, I'm not going to start with this is a for loop and this is a string. You guys already know that stuff. So this is an intro to Ruby kind of at a high level for people who have taken Java. And in the specific case of UC Berkeley, many of you have also taken 61A, Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. You're going to see some of those ideas come back. And those of you uh, who are joining us out in the wider world, don't worry if you haven't, fin uh, haven't been familiar with those ideas because they're cool and we're going to get to them. Good stuff. So let's start with uh, just a laundry list here. What is Ruby? It's an interpreted language, so you don't compile it and run it. It's object-oriented, and as we'll see, it takes object orientation to a whole new level beyond what many of you probably are uh, accustomed to because everything in the language, even like an integer, is a real object. And the only way anything gets done in this language is you call methods on objects. It seems a little bit weird, but once you get used to it, it's a very powerful simplifying principle. It is dynamically typed. What does that mean? It means that there are types in the language, but variables don't have types. Objects have types, but the same variable can spend part of its life being an int, part of its life being something totally different. It is a dynamic language. And uh, hopefully in the rest of uh, the next couple of segments here, we're going to see some specific examples of what that means. Now, what it means on paper is that there's all kinds of things you can do at runtime after the program has already begun. You can add or modify new code. You can change the definition of existing methods after the code has begun. You can ask objects questions about themselves, and you can create new objects based on those properties. But the only reason this matters is to the extent that it makes programming easier to do and e makes your code easier to maintain. So whenever I try to show examples of these things, the examples are going to be focused on how does this feature help you write better code? How does it make your code more readable? Uh, how does it make your code sort of, how, do you, how does it make you feel like you've done a better job? Like you, you've walked away and polished a sculpture of elegance. That's really what it's about. I, I'm into code beauty. All right, so some uh, very basic conventions to get us started here. Names of classes, yes, Ruby has classes. You're going to find out that they don't actually count for as much as you might think in other languages. Uh, you know, in some elitist languages like Java, what class you are is all about what you can do. You know, what you can do is determined by what class you are. Ruby is different. It's very meritocratic. What you can do is really just based on your abilities. Uh, your class doesn't really matter all that much. This is actually true. Uh, so class names use upper camel case. If you've never seen the word before, you can figure out where camel case comes from as a term. Methods and variables usually use snake underscore case. So uh, names of methods. You might find that method names can sometimes end with a question mark. It's idiomatic for a method that is supposed to return true or false, methods that you can use to ask questions about objects. Uh, you'll sometimes find that there are method names that end with a bang, uh, not literally with a boom, but with an exclamation mark, the ASCII bang character. And that usually means it's a dangerous method. Calling this method could cause uh, unintended side effects if you're not careful. So you'll get used to seeing that. There are constants. Usually constants are in all uppercase, uh, all upper camel case. There are globals, but we know globals are terrible, so we're not going to use them. And there are symbols. This is probably one of the first hang-ups people get uh, if they've not come from a language that has the concept of a symbol. So what's a symbol? The syntax for a symbol is just a colon followed by a string of letters and underscores and digits. But a symbol really is kind of like an immutable string whose value is itself. And the reason that in many cases you're going to find that there are methods in Ruby and in Rails where it looks like you could actually pass either a symbol or a string. Now, symbols aren't the same as strings. They're, it's very easy to convert between them. There's methods 2s and 2sim. So when would we want to use a symbol instead of a string? Why do they exist? What we'll usually find is that when a symbol is involved, it connotes specialness. So if I see a function that's being called with the symbol colon Rails, what I, I should interpret that to mean is Rails is one of a small number of special values that this function might understand. It's not a function that is prepared to deal, let's say, with an arbitrary string. So that's not always going to be the case, but very generally that's the case. And we'll see a number of examples of this. Variables, arrays, and hashes. You're all Java programmers, so this should be quick. There are no declarations. You are free from declarations for the rest of the semester. Uh, you can have local variables. You have to assign them before you use them. And as we'll see, when we're defining classes and objects, the instance and class variables spring into existence with the nil value, uh, which is also a value that means false in Ruby until the first time they're assigned. So remember I said that variables don't have types, but objects do have types. 
here's a variable x that I'm assigning to an int, and then I'm assigning it to a string, and that is totally cool. The int and the string are different types, different classes, but the variable to which, uh, the variable that refers to them doesn't have to have a type. This we can't do because there's no declarations, right? There is a class integer, but we can't put the classes in front of variables. Variables don't have classes. So some of this is just going to be breaking out of habits that maybe you've gotten into uh, if you're uh, coming from the Java world. We have arrays, uh, plain old linear arrays, and as you can see from this simple example, arrays don't have to have all the same kind of object in them. So in Java, you talk about an array of ints or an array of foobars. Uh, in Ruby, it's just an array. It can have whatever it wants, and the elements can all be different, as a matter of fact. Um, we can assign the elements using a subscript. Subscripts are zero-based. Uh, we can also ask an array how long it is, and we'll talk about many more interesting methods that arrays come with, but they behave the way you'd expect. We also have hashes. Some languages call these associative arrays. If you've programmed in a language like Perl, you're probably pretty used to these. Uh, Python has them. They call them dicts or dictionaries in Python. So here's an example of a hash literal. You put it in braces. And again, hashes are what? They're a mapping of keys to values. But because variables don't have to have types, the keys can be any type, and the, vari and the values of those keys can be any type. And they, even, they don't all even have to be the same. So here's a hash that has two keys. One key is the single character string A. Another key is the symbol B. Remember, that's different from the string. Um, and in fact, what is the, the value of the uh, symbol B key is an array. So again, just like with arrays, we can mix up the types of the keys and values. We can dereference that array and set its zeroth element to something. And we can ask the hash what its keys are. Then we get back a plain old array, which is just a list in some arbitrary, non-guaranteed order of uh, what the hash's keys are. And there's ways to go through them as well. Methods. Everything is passed by reference. Everything except integers. We'll come to that in a minute. So I can define a single, uh, here's a function foo that takes two arguments. And it actually returns an array or a list of two things. I can define functions that have arguments with optional values. So this says, when I call the foo function, the second argument is optional. And if I don't have a value supplied for the second argument, it gets 0 by default. And when I call a function like the one I've defined here that actually returns a list of things, uh, I can immediately, I can assign the result either to an array, and then I can dereference it, or I can just uh, assign the result to individual uh, variables. Uh, so again, a lot of this stuff, it's in the reference manuals and so on. I'm just trying to give you kind of a, a very high-level whirlwind tour of the language so that you get used to reading code in a language that you maybe haven't seen before. Okay, control flow and statements. Moving right along here. Statements end with a semicolon or a new line, but a new line is way more common. Uh, in fact, getting back to the code beauty thing, a really nice thing about, uh, you know, one of the other things I do besides writing Ruby code and, and teaching great students at UC Berkeley is I'm a musician. Uh, I do musical theater work. I do a lot of orchestration. And if you've anybody play jazz, one of the, the great things about putting together a chart of jazz music for a jazz musician is you want to minimize the number of marks on the page while still communicating everything that the musician has to do. I tend to think of programming the same way. In fact, I've gotten to the point where I like using single quotes around strings instead of double quotes because it's like less pixels on the screen. I'm serious. It's a, it's a compulsion. But what I, where I'm going with this is that in Ruby, even though semicolons can be used to end statements, you never see them. You put each statement on its own line because that's easier to read. It's less stuff per line. Uh, now, does that mean that you can't break a statement across lines? Well, it means you have to be careful with the parser. Uh, here's two examples of a statement, one of which will parse correctly, where the line break is after the word unless. Uh, I'm going to raise a boom exception unless the ship is stable. It would be incorrect to put the line break after raise boom because this statement by itself, raise boom, is actually a legal Ruby statement all on its own. So in this case, the interpreter would be confused because it stops parsing the statement here, and then I have this unless, and where am I? We have all the same basic comparison operators you've already seen. Uh, as we'll see in a moment, the equal twiddle and bang twiddle are used for regular expressions, among other things. There's Boolean true and false. There's Boolean nil, which evaluates as a false value but isn't the same as false. Don't panic. Uh, and then we have the usual control flow construct. So we have if then else, uh, along with else ifs. Uh, we have while or until. And what are these weird things down here? One up to 10 or 10 times? Um, you can try to think of these as loops, but I'd really rather you didn't. 
Uh, in a couple of more sections, we're going to talk about blocks and iterators. And what these really are is a completely different way of thinking about iteration. Instead of thinking about loops, we're going to think about objects that manage their own traversal. Let me say that one more time. Objects get to manage their own traversal. If I am a binary tree, I get to manage how my elements are traversed. If I am an array, I get to manage how my elements are traversed. And usually that would be in straight line order. Uh, in fact, I can define an arbitrary kind of object or data structure that if it has more than one element, it gets to decide how those elements are traversed. And as we'll see, these examples containing up to and times are really just a way of saying, um, I'm going to in place define a sequence of numbers and it's going to manage how it's traversed. But we'll come back to that later. Strings and regular expressions. Regular expressions are so your friend. Um, this would be a great time to start reviewing regular expressions. We'll do a very quick review here. And there's a great site called Rubular, seriously, rubular.com, where you can test out regular expressions against strings and make sure that they do what you want. So how do you express strings? We've got double quotes. We've got single quotes. We've got percent uppercase Q, which means treat this string the same as if it had been in double quotes. So why would you use that? Well, for one thing, you could put double quotes into the string, right? Similarly, percent little Q, treat this string as if it had single quotes around it. And what's the difference between those? Well, one example is in a double quoted string, you can interpolate an expression, right? And notice that I say an expression. When you have a pound braces construct inside a double quoted string, you could put any Ruby expression there of arbitrary complexity. Now, it's bad form to put something in there that's super complex. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. Uh, but in a single quoted string, that doesn't work. Single quoted strings are like verbatim. What about regular expressions? Uh, for reasons that you'll understand better after you've done some Ruby programming, you can actually put the string and the regex on either side of the equal twiddle operator, which is the, the matching operator. So here, I'm going to take the string, fox at berkeley.edu, and I'm going to match it against this regular expression. Now, as you all know, because you all know regular expressions, and I'm just going to review it, but as you all know, uh, this regular expression says match zero or more of any type of character, followed by an at sign, followed by zero or more of any type of character, followed by a dot. The backslash means this dot is not a wildcard. It's actually just a dot. Followed by the letters edu, followed by the end of the string. So in this case, the regular expression match would succeed. Now, what about the fact that edu is in uppercase on the left side, but lowercase on the right side? Well, that's OK, because the trailing i on the regular expression says ignore case. And again, if you've programmed in other scripting languages, like Perl or Python, some of this syntax uh, is heavily overlaps with those languages. I could uh, switch the order of these on either side of the equal twiddle. That works just as well. The return value of this expression is if there was any kind of a match, I get a true value. If a, there was no match, I get a false value. And if the expression contained parenthesized groups, in the event of a match, the variables $1 through $, however many groups there were, capture the partial matches. So in this simple example that I used, $1 would evaluate to fox because this first group of any characters before the at sign matches the first group of characters in my name. And $2 would match Berkeley because the second group of parens matches this group of characters that's before the .edu. Learn them, know them, love them. And lastly, uh, other ways that we can write regular expressions, the, the slashes are sort of the most common idiom. Many languages, including Perl and Python, also use them. But you can also construct them the long way by saying uh, construct a new regex. Uh, and uh, there's also this percent %r brace notation, which you don't see very often, but uh, just in the interest of exposing you to all of these things. So we're going to launch right in today and talk about Ruby as a modern object-oriented language. And uh, if you've come from the Java world, which many of you have, there's all these concepts that you sort of have to assimilate when you do object-oriented programming. You have to learn about objects. You have to learn about the attributes of objects. And you talk about getters and setters on attributes. You talk about the methods that objects support. Uh, maybe if you've done C++, you know about operator overloading. There's things like interfaces, which allow you to add other behaviors to a class. Uh, Java also has these primitive types like integers and you have to box and unbox them in order to do certain things to them. And at some point, you probably found yourself asking whether there isn't a smaller set of mechanisms that supports the things you're trying to do when you're using all these different mechanisms in a language like Java or C++.
So Ruby's dramatic simplification of how to deal with this is to say everything is an object, everything. And the only way you get stuff done is by calling methods on objects. So what does this mean concretely? Well, first of all, even the lowly integer is a true object. That means that you can do things like call methods like days uh, on actual integers. Three days ago will tell you how many seconds it's been since three days ago. Now, in raw Ruby, this won't work. It'll work in Rails. I'll get back to why that happens. But to give you a sense, uh, I can also say 50 dot methods. I'm asking the integer 50, what methods do you respond to? What things do you know how to do? Uh, and in fact, I can explicitly in Ruby talk about uh, responding to. I can ask an object directly what methods do you respond to by using this uh, built-in respond to method. See how good I am at drawing? I'm pretty good, huh? Yeah. Uh, in fact, all of these really can be thought of as syntactic sugar around a single construct, which is the send method. It's a language primitive. And that's the one that says, take the following method call and send it to the object. We say that the object is the receiver in that case. And the only thing Ruby cares about is whether the object you're sending a message to knows how to respond to that message. So for example, if I say 1 plus 2, what I'm really doing is saying shorthand for sending to the receiver, the object 1, the plus plus message with an additional argument of two. That's really what's going on internally at the language level. So plus is really just another method. And it's a method that takes one argument, which is the thing to add to its receiver. Similarly, if I dereference an array with square brackets, really I'm sending the square bracket dereference method to the, uh, the target array. And I'm passing another argument, which is what the subscript is that I want to get. We can do other examples, like when we do array assignment, what's going on here? Well, believe it or not, this is a method call. There's a method call that means assign to an array. And this time, we need two arguments, which subscript to assign and what the new value ought to be at that place. But the important thing here is that there's actually a method defined on arrays called bracket equals. And when you say my array sub 3 equals foo, it's really just a shorthand, syntactic sugar, for calling the bracket equals method with those two arguments. This is a dramatically simplifying thing that you, it takes a little bit of getting used to. But bear with me for just a bit as I work through a, a few more examples. When I do a comparison, again, what am I doing? I'm sending the target a, a message of double equals with another argument of the thing to compare it to. And when I call a regular old function, I'm sending to self, which is the implicit receiver. Right? If you don't see anything before the dot, it means whatever the value of self is. And we'll have a lot more to say about that when we talk about object orientation. So we're sending self the name of a method, my func, and one argument that's expected by that method. And the hope is that self has an instance method called uh, my func in this case, and that my func is prepared to accept an argument. So that's what's going on there. So remember, when we do this, okay, save yourself a lot of grief. When you see the notation a dot b, it means we're calling the method b on the object a. Okay, what does it not mean? It does not mean that b is an instance variable of a. It doesn't mean that a is some kind of a data structure and b is one of the fields of that data structure. It's nothing like that, right? So keeping this in mind will help you parse Ruby expressions that look a little confusing until you get more accustomed to the language, at which point it will seem very natural. So understanding this distinction, keeping this one simple rule in mind, will save you a lot of grief and confusion. Uh, so, I already, so when you say every operation is a method call, going a little more deeply into that, what does it mean? Well, here's three different uses of plus. And somebody unfamiliar with a modern, extremely object-oriented language like Ruby might look at those three lines and say, wow, if those are all legal calls, it must be the case that Ruby has some pretty sophisticated type inference and type conversion in place so that plus knows what to do depending on what the types of its two arguments are. But now that you understand that everything is an object and plus is just a method, it should be clear that what's going on here is these are three different methods. These three uses of plus are three different methods. One of them is the uh, class numerics definition of plus, another one is the array class's definition of plus, and another one is the string class's definition of plus. Now, how does Ruby know which one to use? Well, to take the third example here, when I say y equals quote hello plus quote world, what's the receiver of plus? Well, the receiver is this first argument, hello, and it's a string. So the string class is going to be the one where the plus method gets looked up. The plus method is going to get past a second argument, in this case world, and it had better know how to do something sensible with that argument. So the answer to the question, what if I say foo plus bar and foo plus bar maybe are of different classes or of different types, what happens then? Well, in foo plus bar, foo is the receiver, plus gets sent to it, and it will get past the argument bar, and it has to decide whether it can do something sensible based on what kind of a thing bar is. 
So let's talk about actual object orientation in Ruby. And you know, I've kept saying this mantra, uh, everything is an object. Everything is a method call. Ruby is a dynamic language. So the question is, why should you actually care about this? How does it actually simplify uh, object-oriented programming? So let's look at a simple example to walk through. Uh, I'm going to define a savings account. And hypothetically, I'm going to say that it inherits from an existing class called account, although we don't have an existing class. So I just wanted to show you the syntax for inheritance. Uh, of course, I need a constructor. And in Ruby, the constructor for a class by default is called initialize. Why is it called initialize, but you call it with new? It's just the way the world is. Sorry, kids. Um, what is this initializer going to do? It's going to take one argument, which is, is the initial balance. And note that because I've given the argument an optional value or a default value in the uh, function definition, I can actually call the new function with no arguments, and balance will default to 0. So you can have optional arguments uh, with default values in Ruby as well. And when I call the constructor, it's going to take the balance that I passed in and assign it to an instance variable. Long ago, uh, in the previous lecture, we said that instance variables begin with a single at sign. So at balance is an instance variable, not to be confused with just plain balance, no at sign. That's just a plain old local variable that disappears once we're no longer in the scope of the function. So that's the only thing the constructor does. And now we have a local variable or an instance variable in, in Java terminology to track the value of our account balance. Uh, but of course, we need to be able to get access to that. And unlike Java and some other languages, there's no notion of a public attribute. This instance variable at balance is visible only from within this specific instance of the object. So if somebody outside the object, uh, and certainly outside of the class, wants to get access to that information, you have to define an accessor for it. So here's my simple accessor. Wow, I hope you got that. All it does is return, and, and by the way, uh, in Ruby functions, if there's no explicit return statement, the value of the last expression evaluated in the function is the return value. Everything has a return value. Uh, and if you don't say return, what you get is the last expression evaluated. So there's my really simple accessor, uh, or getter if you prefer. I also need a way maybe to set the balance. Who knows? Maybe I'd like to launder money into my bank account. So here's another function. And yes, balance equals is the name of a method. Remember I said everything is a method call? This is where we're starting to get serious. Okay, So balance equals is a different method from balance. There's a special case in Ruby for methods that end in the equal sign. Um, and that's how you can define your own setters. So balance equals will take a new amount, and it'll just set the instance variable to that. Of course, real bank accounts are not quite this easy to add money to yourself. So we'll get more realistic in a moment. Um, we can also deposit. That's easy enough. We just add the deposit amount onto the uh, instance variable balance. Um, we can also have class variables. Uh, something like the name of the bank might be a variable that is independent of any particular instance. And we get those with the double at sign. Again, class variables are accessible from within the class. If we wanted to have access to that variable from outside the class, we would have to define a specific getter for it. And here would be an example of that getter. Notice the difference in how we define it. We, we define self.bankName. The reason this works, and this is going to take a little bit of getting used to, is because once we've started this declaration class, inside of this declaration, the value of self is the new class being created. So if we say def self dot some method name, what we're really saying is we're defining this method on the class itself, as opposed to these methods, which are being defined on an instance of the class. Right on? And we'll just return the bank name. Notice that we're not providing a setter for the bank name class variable, so you can't set it. Um, and an alternative to saying self.bankName is we could also put the name of the class.bankName. Why is that? Because inside of a class definition, the value of self is exactly the new class that you're in the process of creating. And that's the end of our class definition.